Now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone from the band Drama Rama. And uh, we did have a discussion about how to pronounce that with uh, singer John Easdale. I always say Drama Rama. Just my very sort of hick Canadian way of saying it. And, and I'm told, no, no, it's Drama Rama. But saying it with such pronounced vowels is so slow and tedious. Dramarama. Anyway, either way, uh, John was uh, courteous and kind enough to sit down with me to discuss the band's new album, Color TV, which is out on May 1st, 2020. So if you're hearing it before May 1st, you got something to look forward to. If you're hearing it after May 1st, 2020, check it out. It's actually a fun, fun uh, rock album, maybe alternative rock, maybe a little punk rocky, but but it's still a fun rock album, and it rocks. Let's put it that way. Anyway, um, I'll say uh, anything, anything to get you to listen to this uh, interview. And uh, speaking of anything, anything, I'll give you great song by the band. Uh, some of you might remember it back from uh, from the good old early '80s, but I really discovered it. I had heard it back then, but I really, really got an appreciation for it when a band that I love called Buck Cherry covered it. And I think Buck Cherry's cover of that song is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So I do encourage you to check out both the uh, Dramarama, Dramarama version of it, or the uh, Buck Cherry version of it. Both uh, great. Uh, You'll you'll enjoy that. And uh, so here we go. And and by the way, I I will be, uh, like I said, on the last uh, episode or on the Steve Riley episode, uh, taking a short break from the uh, from the show, some people wrote me and said, "Oh, it's terrible! You're ending the show." I'm not ending the show. I'm taking a break. If you've noticed over the last two, three, four, five years, you've had shows at Christmas and New Year's and Easter and summer vacation, and they're, they're, I've done 52 weeks a year for three, four years now, no breaks, uh, multiple episodes in in. Each week, sometimes episodes had two or three guests. They'd be like two-hour episodes. Uh, I've just never taken a little bit of time. So I just want to take, I want to finish the ones that I have. I've got Glenn Hughes in the can. I've got Danny Griego in the can. I've got uh, Michael Alago in the can. I want to get those ones out. And I want to step back, breathe, refresh, and get going. And uh, it's a perfect time. Listen, uh, the rock world is shut down tight thanks to the uh, current world situation with the with the virus. And uh, it's a good time to just take a little break. And then when the virus thing ends and all these shows and album releases and people are going to want to talk, I'll be ready to go. So, uh, you know, listen, I'll probably have like two or three weeks with no shows, and then I'll be right back. So, uh, you know, on se calme, as we say in Quebec. Anyway, uh, here is uh, from Drama Rama. Sorry. Or Drama Rama, the way I say it, like a cartoon character. I'm like, I'm like the Elmer Fudd of podcasting. Uh, here is the one and only John Easdale. We are speaking with uh, Drama Rama, the front man. John Easdale. The new album is Color TV, coming out May 1st, and I've heard it, and it is spectacular. Uh, John, as we say in Montreal, bonjour, how are you? Really good. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. So let, let's get into this, because there's a lot of history with the band. We go all the way back to the 80s. You, you've been pr- you know, very productive in the 80s, and you've been less productive here and there, but this album's been sort of 20 years in the making. Talk to me about this, and why is it a good time in 2020 to say, okay, it's time for new Dramarama music? You know, I, 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 that's a hard one to answer, to be honest with you. I, I, I don't know that this is a good time or, or a bad time. It's, it's just when we finally were able to, to wrap things up and finish it. We, uh, we worked in fits and starts. Uh, we, we weren't able to, you know, it wasn't like we just went in and did it all in two weeks in the studio and then put it out. But of course, the situation of the music business being what it is, and also the situation of, of a band of our, uh, how should I say, vintage being what it is, there's not a lot of, you know, new music from old bands isn't always what people are looking for, you know, to be honest with you. And I think we had to 
you know, take our time, both working on the recordings and also finding the right outlet to put it out. Uh, actually, it's changed so much since we started recording. Uh, streaming was not in the picture. Downloads, I think, had probably just come around. Uh, we actually started recording them probably closer to 10 years ago uh, after our last album came out. Um, and again, that even that was like five years after our last album came out. But uh, yeah, we're, 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 we work slower as we get older, but we still hopefully, you know, make something that uh, people can enjoy. So, all right. So talk to me about that, about this thing with new music, because there's this weird sort of vibe with fans. You know, when you are, are like a band like Van Halen and you don't do anything, people say, oh, where's Van Halen? They need to put out new music and tour. But if you're a band like Kiss, they go, oh, maybe they should go home because they're always on the road. Uh, talk to me about the challenges of getting new music put out there and and the, and having a need for it because as an artist i would assume there's a creative need to say something new and not just rely on what you said 30 years ago well yeah it, it, it not that i'm you know i'm very proud of our body of work so to speak but but yeah the the the, the last few years I've, I've had a lot of offers from people to put out our old music and i've kind of you know hesitated to do that because i was i was working on new music and 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 i was way more you know focused on that um i can't really say what it is with 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 the public you know and and their tastes uh you know of course van halen sold millions and millions of records and and drum rama sold thousands you know we, we we're, we're lucky enough to still be around and uh and to have some history but nothing like you know multi-million selling bands we just we just keep plugging along and uh oh, it's hard to say it, it's really hard to say what 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 motivates a, an individual i know i myself write a lot less songs nowadays than i used to i don't know if that's because there's less demand or you know the record company isn't saying we got to get a new record out or whatever but it's a lot i'm i'm a lot less prolific put it that way well, I can I can imagine. Well, okay, so so talk to me then about how do you create the uh, demand? I mean, you look at uh, at different bands, and some of them it's 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 on incessant touring and incessant merch sales, and a sense of this. How do you create demand then? How do you know? You look at at your track record: Cinema Verite eighty five, uh, Office Bomb eighty seven, Wonder uh, Wonder Rella, whatever. I can't, I've never been able to pronounce that album. Eighty like you had this every two years. You were giving them something new. Where did it change? Where where did it, if you want, take a left turn? Well, in 1994, the band, for all intents and purposes, stopped playing together. We 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 had had uh, our fill of one another, and also our fill of the music business. We we had been fighting and fighting and you know climbing the ladder, and and I think the last album we put out just didn't get the the attention that we, you know, we, we personally thought it deserved. And we were also were, uh, having difficulties with our record company and, and the music business at large. And we just called a halt to the proceedings. So that stopped for a number of years. I put out a solo album in 1998, but, uh, there just wasn't, you know, there wasn't a band for, for almost 10 years in 2003, there was a, a show on VH1 called Bands Reunited, and uh, they they called upon us to to do our you know to get back together, and we did. Uh, at least, eventually, some of us stayed together, and uh, it's it's still me and, and the two original guitar players. I, I I can't really say what made us stop. You know, again, like I said, I, I don't know that I dried up, but I just don't write as many songs, and and I think that the the way. That, the demand for in general, you know, most bands don't put a record out any every year at, anymore. When I was growing up, you know, Elton John put out a record, you know, two records every three years or something, you know. And and before that, when I was when I was really young, bands put out two albums every year. Uh, the business no longer requires you to put out that many records. I think back then they were trying to strike while the iron is hot, so to speak. And uh, and to be honest, I think people the the way people consume music nowadays. I don't think there's that voracious appetite for 
you know, three bands every two years from, from, from artists and artists go years, you know, several years between albums. Uh, in this last, you know, in the, in, in the case of this last one, I can't really say what took so long, but uh, it, again, it, it had a lot to do with demand. And quite honestly, when it comes to demand, I've never been one to think about the marketplace when I was writing songs or when I was making music. Um, it, it's way more about making music than it is about making records. It, it's way more about creating than selling. It is. And, and uh, so let me take it. And by the way, the uh, the Bands Reunited episode was fantastic. That was one of the great ones. And that was a great show. But um, let me ask you about then the marketplace, because you come out or you, you form sort of in the early 80s, 81, 82. And the market is just saturated with The Knack and Journey and REO Speedwagon and Foreigner, these great sort of arena rock pop kind of things. And then as we move into the late 80s, it's all the hair metal bands. And of course, Dramarama is nothing like that. You're your own thing, to your to your credit. But in terms of marketplace, how, how difficult was it for you to forge ahead with a Dramarama sound and not go do, you know, Hot Blooded or not go do Looks That Kill and, and really just sort of stick to your thing? I don't even know how we describe your thing. It's sort of like a, a, a punky dram. Talk to me about that and, and writing and, and creating your own space and not trying to expand into what was cool at the time. Well, when we started the band, it was about what we liked and what we wanted to sound like. And I don't think we ever expected to become, you know, uh, I don't think we ever expected to, for music to be our career. I think it was just something we did for our own enjoyment and and make music that we wished you would hear on the radio or on MTV or whatever. but we didn't do our, you know, we, we weren't pushing for that. We weren't trying to, to make it. We were just making music for our own enjoyment. And, and that was the beginning. And I don't think we ever expected to get on the radio or, or sell records. And I think we were as surprised as anyone when, when that became the case. Uh, and through the years, that's been, that's been the, the driving force and, and, and the same principle remains. We, we just try to make music that, we can be proud of and that hopefully will entertain people and, and doesn't in, insult anybody's intelligence and uh, just try to do good quality work and, and not, you know, certainly not follow fashion or fads or, or anything like that because, you know, sadly, or, or for whatever reason, music from a lot of music from the eighties and nineties sounds old, you know, it's dated and, and, and you have certain drum sounds and, and keyboard sounds that you hear them once and you're like, Oh, that's eighties, nineties. That's, that's, that's old music, you know? And, and luckily we stuck to the classic guitars and drums and, you know, just, just straight rock and roll. Yeah. Straight rock. And, and, and nothing says eighties, like a Lynn drum. Every, every single song had that stupid <laughs> machine on it. Jesus Christ. Um, but all right, let me get back to, to a color TV and then, and then I'll dig back into some of the past stuff too. Uh, now that this one's out, and it's been 20 years in the making, it's sort of your, your Chinese democracy. Uh, does that motivate you now to, in 2021, 2022, get another album out? Or is this where you go, okay, it's done. Now leave me alone. Like, how do you see it moving forward? Well, uh, I think I mentioned before, I don't write nearly as many songs as I used to. So it'll probably be a couple of years before we make another record. And, uh, well, obviously now... There's no no opportunity to, to to tour or play concerts. The the concert business is shut down for the for the time being, um, and we've never been one of those bands that was on the road 300 nights a year. We're 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 way more of a studio band, I would say, and and we play concerts whenever we get a chance, but uh, never been a, a, a touring band, so to speak. Um, I would love to put a new record out as soon as I have a, a nice batch of songs that, that was another part even though it was 20 years in the making so to speak that's i started writing the songs 20 years ago started recording the album 10 years ago but we again we weren't in the studio constantly for those 10 years we just went in when we could get a chance to go in uh and uh that had as much to do with it as anything was that we weren't really able to get in the studio all that much and then once it was finished we were looking for a good avenue to, to release it uh we didn't want to do it all by ourselves because everybody does it all by yourself. And, you know, uh, uh, as they say, the cliche is uh, 
anyone who represents themselves as a lawyer has a fool for a client. Um, we just didn't have the, the, the resources or the, or the confidence to do it all by ourselves. So we were lucky to find a, a company that was willing to partner with us and, and help us in, with the things that we can't do ourselves, like radio promotion and publicity and, and things like that. Yeah, and Pasadena Records is doing a, a great job so far. Uh, let me just go back real quick to uh, Cinema Verité, the uh, first, first album uh, on there. Of course, you've got Anything, Anything I'll Give You, which, of course, was covered by Buck Cherry, which is how I discovered the band, uh, to be honest. Um, talk to me about a song like that, because it is so big and so mythical. Is it, and I, and I had this conversation with the Nax Doug Feger once about My Sharona, and he said to me, it was like a golden albatross. The, you know, the song paid for my pool, but at the same time, every time I went into the record company, they would say, ah, I don't hear, I don't hear another My Sharona, so write some more. How big of a song was that for you in your career in terms of moving the ball forward? But how much also was it of a disadvantage where record companies and fans would go, that's nice, but I don't hear another anything, anything. Could you try again? Do you know what I mean? Well, let's put it this way. That song definitely took us out of our homes where we lived in New Jersey and, and moved us across the country. We started getting played on a radio station in Los Angeles. And uh, it, it changed it changed everything. It, it took us from being a, a band that put out our own records and, and, and did our own thing completely to... to to be in a band that played concerts and, and, and did a lot of it, 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 it definitely changed the way we were perceived and it changed. It took us from being amateurs to quote unquote professionals. Um, in the terms of it being our signature song, it, it definitely still is. We, we sometimes get to play at these eighties concerts that they, they put on. And, uh, that's the song everybody wants to hear. So it, it continues to, to resonate. At the it, same time, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were finished, but I, I, I'm just curious, though, as a songwriter, you write this song, and it has this massive success and this massive appeal. Do you spend time afterwards sort of deconstructing it, trying to write? Like, you go, huh, I, th I write this like everything else. Why is this one working and the, and the, the one I wrote last week not working? Like, how, do you sort of like start analyzing and overthinking it and trying to write another one like it? How does that affect your songwriting? Well, again, like I said, I, I never was trying to sell records. To I wasn't writing songs to sell records, and I was never expected to to become a professional musician. It was just something I love to do with with great passion, and and still do. Uh, I never ever tried to recreate it or duplicate the the song. It would it would be easy to write another song that sounded almost exactly like it i'm sure it would be easier to do something like that than to, to try to write something new and different um i don't i, I and luckily early on we we did we did it all ourselves uh we started our own record company and and we put the records out ourselves the first couple and uh never had anyone from a record company ever say oh we need to hear this or we don't hear a single or or this that and the other it wasn't until like our fourth album that we actually started getting input from the record company and even by then we had already made three albums by ourselves so we weren't too uh, uh open to 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 suggestion i would say and that probably had a lot to do with uh the problems we had with the music business was that we were very stubborn and uh unwilling to listen to to their uh input so we were, were constantly uh, butting heads with 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 the record company people yeah, but for some bands that works. I, I want to ask you this just for a moment, and, and I and I ask it respectfully because I'm in Montreal, and of course uh, Jesse Farbman, also known as a non Jesse, moved up here and uh, passed away up here. Talk to me about him being the co-founder of the band, and and what did he mean to you both professionally and uh, personally, and and just you know uh, may he rest in peace. I, I just I want to just get that in there. Well, thank you very much. Jesse was like our fourth or fifth drummer. If you, if you look at the credits for Cinema Verite, there are like three or four different drummers on that record, including myself. Uh, when we started the band, I was the drummer, and we, we were strictly studio, and there were three of us. There was a bass player, Chris Carter, and, and guitarist Mark Engler, and myself, uh, who Mark went under the name of Mystery Boy. Uh, but 
when it came time to play live, we needed a drummer and we brought in another guitar player, Peter Wood. And that was, you know, 1981, 1982. Uh, Jesse came along, I want to say 1983, 1984. And he was just the perfect fit for us. He, he, he grew up in our, our same town in Wayne, New Jersey, and he was the perfect drummer for us and, 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 and a, and a great guy and a great friend. And, he definitely took the journey with us from amateur band that played in the basement to playing concerts and moving across the country and then actually touring in Europe and, and making albums. And, you know, that was a wonderful thing. And I think that opened up Jesse's eyes to the possibilities of the world itself, you know, and, and he was a lot more moved by our, our, travels around the country and uh, in Europe. And I think that changed him from just wanting to be a drummer in a rock band. And he became a much more spiritual person. He went to live in India for, for a time. And that's when I think that that began his journey from being just a drummer in a band named Jesse to Jesse Farman to uh, becoming an aunt Jesse, uh, a, a very spiritual and, 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 uh, I hate to say mystical human being, but someone who saw the possibilities of beyond where well, the, this 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 mortal coil, so to speak. He, yeah. uh, well, he found peace. He, he, yeah, no, he was he was a lot happier. I know, you know, living up in, by the time he moved up to Montreal and and, and doing what he was doing, and, and he's still doing music. I know he made an album called Mantrika. But uh, he also just he, he just became a different person. He 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 expanded and, and evolved into this amazing human being. And it, it's often said that the the brightest lights burn out a little faster. And I and I think that might have been the case with Jesse because he he was a brilliant human being, and he, he shined. And uh, it is a, a terrible shame that he passed away. I, I was really l glad and, and thrilled when he was able to, to join us for the, for the, re the VH1 reunited thing. But it was obvious at that time that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't in any mood to come back and, and become a drummer in, in a rock and roll band and ride around in a van and play concerts. You know, he, he had, he had gone beyond that. And uh, I was glad he came back to do that with us. And, and he was able to do that before he, he moved on. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm going to finish with these two questions. Now, we've mentioned Band Reunited a, a couple of times. Uh, how much of that show was real and how much was it scripted? I mean, did they phone ahead of time and say, listen, we're going to do this thing and we're going to pretend? Or was it like, hey, there's uh, John. Let's let's see if we can get him to do this. Re you know, how much of that was real and how much of it was just TV? It was 100% candid camera it was absolutely real i was expecting a phone call from vh1 because they were doing like uh remember the 80s uh, uh, kind of a shows back then so i was told i was going to get a phone call from vh1 so i was sitting there ready for them because they i don't think they wanted to bring a camera crew and, and i wasn't home so i was sitting there ready for them everyone else they they discovered they found them at their places of business uh as, as far as i can remember um so they knew they would be at work, but I wasn't working at the time. I, I, I had just lost my job. And, uh, so I was home sitting in the garage waiting for them. I didn't even have a shirt on and they just showed up with a camera crew and, and, and totally surprised me. If you go back and look at it, I'm like, this is totally uncool. And the whole thing, I mean, once that was set up and they got us all to, to participate, we were all involved obviously we all showed up to to rehearse and to re, to do our the the first concert that part but it was entirely from our from our from our side it was entirely organic and we were not prepared and we had no idea before before the fact all right so then ask me this uh, answer this then why did you do it why did you not just say hey piss off why why say okay you know, was it just for fun? Was it just sort of to, to have closure and put a, you know, a period at the end of the sentence on the band? Or was it like, hey, you know what? Maybe with some VH1 exposure, we can we can give this a second shot. Honest to goodness, I think we all thought it was going to be a one one and done kind of a deal. I don't think we expected anything more to come of it other than, like you said, to have some closure 
and get back together and do something. I mean, we were all still friends and I still played with the guys. Uh, Mark was still in my band when I, when I played at solo shows and, and Peter, whenever we would go back East uh, to play, he would get up and play with us. So, so we were all still close. We didn't expect drama Rama to go beyond that VH1 thing, but then we had an opportunity to play a festival here in Southern California and the response was beyond what we expected. It was it was thrilling, and and uh, uh, I, I I don't know how to describe it, 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 but it, but but the response at that concert was like, wow, people like Dramarama still, and people would be willing to see us, and and maybe we should keep this going. Now, unfortunately, Jesse didn't even make that concert, and the bass player had also not wanted to continue with us. Uh, and we, he was, he was onto his own, own thing. He'd moved on. He was a DJ. He's actually, you can hear him on breakfast with the Beatles on Sirius XM radio. And he, he's a, uh, he's a DJ and he's got his own thing going. The rest of us were all kind of ready for something to do. So I, I the, the bass player and the drummer who, who played that festival with us had been playing in my solo band with me for a number of years. So the five of us have been together ever since then, and that was 2003. So it's going on 17 years since Drama Rama got back together, and we stayed together just because it felt right, and because we were we were able to, because there was there was the quote unquote people wanted to see us, and and we were you know really thrilled to have the opportunity to, to do it again, and we'd had enough time apart and and away from it to to not you know have some of the, the, the bad feelings or the mixed feelings say that we had when we were ready to, to give up the ghost originally. Yeah. And of course, uh, Chris Carter's uh, breakfast with the Beatles is on Sirius XM, which is uh, worth listening to. I've had a chance to listen and uh, I will finish with this today. Uh, but hold on. I will just quickly remind uh, color TV is going to be out May 1st. Do check that out. But uh, in the uh, early nineties, you did hi-fi sci-fi with Clem Burke of Blondie on drums and also Sylvan Sylvan of the New York Dolls came in for a little bit, background vocals and stuff. Um, talk to me about working with, with Clem, because if you look back at the early 80s with Rapture and all that, I mean, Blondie was the real deal. I mean, that, that was the shit. Um, talk to me about having him in the band, and, and how did you get the guy from Blondie to be in your band? Well, it's not a long story, but... Uh, uh, I went to see Blondie back in 78, 79. And I was a teenager who was in love with Debbie Harry and, and loved that album, a parallel lines and their first two albums. And I went to go see the band having no idea that I was going to leave being the biggest Clem Burke fan in the world. He's one of the most entertaining and exciting drummers that you could ever watch and, and, and listen to. He's, he's just one of the best drummers of all time. Now cut, ahead 10 years or whatever, however many years it was, 12 years, 15 years, I'm not sure exactly. But when we were making our fourth album, when we were getting ready to make our fourth album, Jesse quit the band something like uh, a week before we were going on tour and uh, we were in dire straits. So we, we ended up doing that tour with, with another drummer and we went into the studio and used a studio drummer named Brian McLeod and uh, when it came time to tour, we were lucky enough to get turned on to Clem by a rock and roll DJ here in Los Angeles named Rodney Bingenheimer, who was on a radio station in Los Angeles. Who He was the guy who brought us out to, to California and, and put us on the map on this station in Los Angeles called R KROQ. Uh, now, now you can hear him on Sirius XM, uh, Rodney on the Rock. But he was the one who introduced us to Clem. And, and for that fourth album, Vinyl, that was the first time when we were able to have a budget uh, from the record company. And we, we actually brought in a number of musicians like Mick Taylor, who used to be in the Rolling Stones, and Ben Montench, who was uh, in the Heartbreakers uh, with Tom Petty. And we, we used you know outside musicians, Jim Keltner, the drummer, and it was amazing and it opened our eyes to the ability that we could get these kind of guys. So we found Clem and he joined the band and toured with us for the album vinyl. And then when it came time to go in the studio for hi-fi sci-fi, he was 
you know, for all intents and purposes, a member of the band and he recorded it with us. And it's one of the, uh, the things I'm, I'm very proud of and, and pleased with. And, uh, and I'm happy to still call him a friend and colleague. In fact, we just made a 45 together by a band called the reckless drifters. And, uh, we, 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 we cover an Ernest tub song and, uh, and do a country version of Love Will Tear Us Apart by <laughs> Joy Division. Um, so Clem and I have remained close, and we still talk, and we still play together. So, yeah, very proud, very pleased and proud to be his pal. Wow, that's great news. Uh, and, and on that, uh, John, thank you. Just a, a great pleasure, and, and uh, Dramarama and, and everything, and the new album, Color TV, May 1st. Uh, folks, do check that out. As we say in Montreal, merci, thank you. Not at all. This has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter, at Mitch LaFon, and on Instagram, at Mitch underscore LaFon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.